One Piece is in a crazy place right now. Between finally meeting Vegapunk and this Ancient Kingdom stuff, I mean, what can I say? We're in the home stretch. It feels like a lot of the biggest mysteries are going to start unfolding soon, and for that reason I can't help but painstakingly pore over every new detail and catch whatever breadcrumbs Oda drops me before he flat out gives us the answer. After the recent chapter 1066 and all the O'Hara revelations that came with it, I was compelled by my viewers to go reread the Robin flashback. Little did I know that in doing so, one tiny idea would soon work its way into my head, and once the details came together, the conclusion I reached had me kinda shook. We now know that the burning of O'Hara is the inciting incident that led Dragon to start the Revolutionary Army. Well, what if Dragon is not the only one who declared war on the world government that day? What if the events of that day spawned a covert branch of the Marines designed to take down the world government? What if the Buster Call on O'Hara is only the prelude to a much bigger Buster Call on Mary Joie? Yes, it's One Piece conspiracy time, guys, so strap on your tinfoil straw hat because today I'm going to explain why the Revolutionary Army may be a lot bigger than we ever imagined. At its core, One Piece is a story about freedom fighters. It's what the Straw Hats are in simple terms. That's what pirates truly are in the world that Oda created. People who seek freedom from the flag of an oppressive government and choose to raise their own flag instead. In other words, the core conflict driving this story is a bitter struggle between man and master, the oppressed and the oppressor. And this worldwide tug of war takes place between two major armed factions, pirates and marines. Most characters in the story fall into one of these two categories, but the line in the sand between good and bad is rather muddled. Pirates bring chaos wherever they go and do not let the law limit them. As a result, innocent people are often caught in the crossfire, and over the years this has driven the public to hate pirates. The marines, in turn, are meant to keep the peace, stop these acts of piracy, and keep the public blissfully ignorant by any means necessary. Oftentimes, those means are incredibly violent and likewise result in the deaths of innocents, making them not any better than pirates. By and large, one side is wild and violent, and the other is dominating and cruel. Pick your poison. Sure, there are good actors on both sides, pirates and marines, actually going out there and helping people, but even the good that they do is limited by the greater powers above them. Even the kindest marine, at the end of the day, still has to answer to Sakazuki. So what if you decide you don't want to be a marine anymore? What if you decide you don't want to be a pirate either, but also don't want to support the world government? What are the people on neither side supposed to do? Where can the people of the world turn to if both sides have failed them? Well, luckily there is a third faction in One Piece, waiting in the background whose allegiances lie somewhere in between. Neither pirate nor marine, the Revolutionary Army is the answer many people in the world have chosen. They're the only faction whose explicit mission statement is to fight for the people against the powers that be, and so, as characters in the story continue to suffer at the hands of pirates or marines, as people become disillusioned with the working order of the world, the Revolutionary Army grows. The extensive harm caused by both sides of this conflict feeds into and fuels this new third faction that will soon challenge the world to a grand war. Needless to say, I have a lot of hype for the revolutionaries, and what makes the revolutionary army and dragon in particular so interesting to me is how long Oda has been setting them up. We are first introduced to Dragon in chapter 100, titled The Journey Begins, which marks the end of the prologue and the beginning of the Straw Hats journey into the Grand Line. Dragon is the only reason Luffy was released by Smoker and made his escape. Dragon is also possibly the only reason Luffy escaped the execution stand, but then he disappears into the background of the story with no mention for hundreds of chapters, and when he comes back up again we find out that Papa over here is the only reason Luffy even exists in the first place, but aside from that we learn next to nothing else about him aside from his reputation as the most dangerous man in the world leading the revolutionary army, the only group directly championing the cause that Luffy just took up at Enya's lobby. People always talk about how Dragon and Luffy look nothing alike, I mean even Luffy admits it, but there's no denying that they're father and son. They both share the same general traits along with Conqueror's Hockey, and they share the same blood type along with Garp. They have a knack for gathering people under their banner, have comparable moral standards, and as a result often fight for the same causes. And while many times it feels like Dragon is not present in his kid's life, it's at least fitting that a man like him, who likely values freedom as much as Luffy does, let him chart his own life's course. He let him decide who he wanted to be, without being forced into joining his own cause. But that also doesn't mean 
he has ignored Luffy. Dragon and his forces, either intentionally or unintentionally, have been picking up the pieces after Luffy for the whole story. Like I said before, Dragon aided in Luffy's escape from Logetown. Dragon saved Luffy's sworn brother from death and took him into his care. Dragon's forces in Impel Down gave Luffy their full support, in part because of nepotism. Kuma, who was a founding member of Dragon's revolutionaries, saved the Straw Hats at Sabaody Archipelago, after which Dragon took a Straw Hat directly under his wing and Ivankov, a another founding member took in another. And now Dr. Vegapunk, another ally of Dragon's, has taken the Straw Hats in and begun informing them about the Void Century and the revolutionary cause. No matter which way you cut it, the Straw Hats journey would have looked very, very different if not for Dragon and the Revs. They may not have even survived. Call him a bad father all you want, but Monkey D. Dragon has been a guardian angel for our protagonists. But what this also tells us is not only that Dragon is helping the Straw Hats, but that he's always one step ahead. He's always making moves that benefit Luffy, but doing so requires some degree of foresight. Luffy was ready to enter the Grand Line, and Dragon was already there to see him off. Luffy declared war on the world government, but Dragon already did so 20 years ago. Luffy wants to become Pirate King, and in the process, ends up changing the world. Dragon, however, is not an adventurer. He's a man on a mission. Dragon's only purpose in life is to change the world. While Luffy and his crew are just now learning about all the hidden injustices committed by the world government, Dragon has already been aware of them for a long, long time, and all the while has been planning a counterattack, which leads me to the first major idea of this theory, that Luffy is not going to be the one who starts the final war in One Piece. The war that people think is going to ultimately occur on Marijoie will not be one that Luffy begins, it will be one that he takes takes part in and ultimately achieves victory as a part of, but the figure leading the charge in will be Monkey D. Dragon. Luffy is not the type of person to plan and execute a large-scale physical war on his own. He fought Crocodile on behalf of Vivi, but the war that broke out was not his doing. It was Koza and the rebel forces of Alabasta who did that. He went to Marineford to save Ace, but the war there was started by Whitebeard. The alliance and plot to take down Kaido was an idea that came from law. The raid on Onigashima was primarily coordinated by the Scabbards and was going to happen regardless of Luffy, but they asked him for help and he came along because he's a good person. However, he didn't make the decision to start any of these wars. They are always catalyzed by the supporting cast of characters surrounding Luffy, not the main characters, and the Straw Hats' eventual involvement is only a consequence of their heroism. Dragon, on the other hand, has explicitly stated that he wants to build up an armed force and go to war. He doesn't love the idea of war, but has deemed it the only means by which change can happen. A war directly against the world government is his motivation, not Luffy's. It's a battle that he's been planning for, for decades. He's the one who's been directly stoking the fire, and the escalating severity of the world government's actions recently have taken place in direct response to the revolutionary movement, not to Luffy and Wano, but to Sabo and Lulucia. The last time the world government targeted Luffy's brother, Whitebeard brought a war to their doorstep and Luffy joined in. Now it's happening again. Luffy's other brother is in the crossfire, and this time, he's the right-hand man for a different legend who is also conveniently planning a war. A final war against the final villain that Luffy will be dragged into. The thing is, and I'll be honest, Dragon's forces have not been very impressive so far. Yes, they've been doing a lot of damage, I guess, in the background, but are they capable of taking the world government head-on? The last surprise attack they did on Marijoie seemed to end in failure, so it's hard to believe that the Revs can manage to pull off a war of that scale successfully. The real question I'm asking here is, is that the best they can do? Considering all the build-up and the reputation they have, I'm confident in saying no, they can do much better. But how? Are they hiding something? An ace up the sleeve? I've played around with the idea that the Revolutionary Army is hiding their power level a bit, and that they haven't shown us what they're fully capable of. And I think it's because they're waiting for the right opportunity. And there's an interesting piece that fits into this theory, which may give us an explanation for what they're actually planning, and it has to do with Dragon's family, the Monkey family. If we can agree that pirates, marines, and revolutionaries make up the three main factions in One Piece currently, then it's probably important that each generation of the Monkey family is a leading figure in their respective group. They are all rebellious, none of them bear any respect for the world nobles, and they have all had a major hand in shaping the course of history. Chapter 398 is the final chapter of the Ohara flashback titled Declaration of War. 
In this chapter, Usopp shoots the flag and Luffy essentially declares war on the world government. But very recently, we've learned that this same event is also what spurred Dragon to declare war as well and create the revolutionary army, like father, like son. What this means is that the burning of Ohara caused two separate members of the Monkey family, from two separate factions under two separate circumstances, to declare war on the same enemy. Each side had its own victims. Luffy did it for Robin. Dragon did it for Clover and Olvia. But what about the Marines? They were involved in this too. Well, as far as the rest of the world could tell, the Marines had a casualty of their own. Jaguar D. Saul is a Marine Vice Admiral and someone who has become a point of fascination for a lot of us now that he has made a comeback in the story. He's the only other Marine besides Garp to be a part of the D Clan and most importantly, he seemed to have good relations with Garp and Aokiji who were fellow Vice Admirals at the time. Which makes me a little suspicious, because Saul is the first example we have of a marine betraying the world government, and he does so to aid in the revolution. If Garp and Aokiji were his buddies, well, Aokiji was actually there, and cursed with the task of executing his friend. And we now know Saul survived. Somehow. Aokiji was also responsible for letting Nico Robin escape. You know, Nico Robin, daughter of a revolutionary, the only scholar left in the world who can read the Poneglyphs and is a major threat to the world government. Yeah, that one. This same Aokiji, later on in the story, outright left the Marines, so it's safe to conclude that this event was also a turning point in Aokiji's sense of justice. It's the point where he doubted the orders he was being given and took justice into his own hands. So now we have two former Vice Admirals, including one with a D, who both betrayed the Marines because of the Ohara Buster Call. And we have two Monkey family members who declared war on the government because of this same event. So who declared war over Saul? You've probably guessed it, but the crossover here lies in Monkey D. Garp, a former Vice Admiral like the others who was mysteriously not present for the Buster Call. So what's Garp's connection to all this? When Luffy and Aokiji first met, Aokiji froze Luffy and threatened to kill him right there, but he ultimately spared Luffy's life because he's close with Garp. More specifically, he implied that Garp helped him out a long time ago and said he owes him a debt. How long ago did this happen? What exactly does Aokiji owe a debt to Garp for? Well, the Ohara Buster Call was 22 years ago, quite a long time. What if Garp helped Aokiji save Saul back then? Aokiji seemed nervous when Cypherpole spoke of Saul's death. Is it possible that he already knew that Saul survived? Is it possible that he came to Garp, the only person he could trust, for help? because he knows Garp refuses promotions and refuses to answer to the world nobles. I always found it weird that Garp is said to have refused the Admiral promotion because Vice Admiral is the highest you can go without having to answer to the Celestial Dragons. And yet, in the case of a Buster Call ordered by Marijoie, the Vice Admirals are the ones forced to take the call. So Vice Admirals aren't always free to choose whether or not they take part in the atrocities commanded from above. And Garp is not the type to listen to authority, so maybe he said enough is enough. Maybe he decided to help Kuzan, and if Garp did help him, then that can only mean one thing. I think it didn't stop at Dragon. There's a real possibility that the massacre of Ohara was an event that caused all three members of the Monkey family to separately declare war against the world government. Maybe this was Garp's turning point. Maybe Sengoku, who is really close with both Garp and Aokiji, had a change of heart as well. Maybe on that fateful day, Garp, Sengoku, and Aokiji began a new task force within the Marines, operating in secret and off the radar, a unit called SWORD. I believe that SWORD is not just any covert operation, but part of a grand conspiracy within the Marines intending to perform a coup d'etat against the world government. I believe this is the same unit that Rocinante was a part of, and it would make sense that this anti-establishment organization was using Corazon to spy on a former Celestial Dragon. This would also serve to explain a few things. Aokiji is someone who has a strong moral code, however, he doesn't take his job as Admiral seriously, being known for his own brand of lazy justice. If this was all part of a secret objective, then maybe he's lazy because he didn't actually want to be in the position he's in. Maybe he doesn't like having to answer to the top brass. Maybe Aokiji, a young up-and-coming marine, developed a secret objective of accepting a promotion to Admiral and working his way up the ladder. When Marine Ford happened and Garp was hit where it hurt most, he effectively resigned from his position. Sengoku, soon to retire, followed in his footsteps and opted to have Aokiji replace him. When Akainu challenged this and became Fleet Admiral instead, 
Aokiji, along with Garp and Sengoku, also left the Marines. So, the splitting of Punk Hazard may serve as a visual metaphor for the state of the Marine allegiances right now. The island is divided in half between the powers of Aokiji and the powers of Akainu. And likewise, I believe that the Marines are secretly split between Akainu supporters and Aokiji supporters. There are clearly people not happy with Sakazuki's leadership right now. There are characters we know for sure would have preferred someone else. And there are characters who have directly challenged Sakazuki or have outright betrayed the world nobles. I think it is not unreasonable to assume there is a significant segment of the Marines who want to see a change and are currently taking action towards that. But I don't think the buck stops there. I believe these Marines are not only working against the world government, but also working with the revolutionaries. Not only do I think Garp and Dragon are in on this together, but I think there are converted members of the revolutionary army right now wearing Marine coats and hiding amongst the upper ranks. Why? A few reasons. Vegapunk spoke with Dragon on the day he decided to form the Revolutionaries. When Dragon chastised him for working with the government, Vegapunk mysteriously reminded Dragon, quote, The world government is a massive organization. In the Navy in particular, there are many reasonable people to be found. Don't lose sight of the goal. Reasonable people? And what goal? Wasn't the Revolutionary Army not formed yet? What shared goal are Vegapunk and Dragon referring to, and why are the Marines being implicated in this? If Vegapunk shares a goal with Dragon and Vegapunk has been working for the world government and the Marines all these years, then that sets the precedent for world government affiliated figures having revolutionary ties. Kuma is another example being a former warlord. And then there's Dragon himself. Dragon is, as we know, a revolutionary. His flagship, the Wind Grandma, is a reference to the Grandma Yacht, which Fidel Castro, leader of the Cuban revolution used to transport his men into Cuba and overthrow the government. In this instance, speaking to Vegapunk, Dragon is also dressed in fatigues that are very reminiscent of Fidel Castro's typical outfit. This is 100% intentional as Oda made another reference to the Cuban revolution through a cover story involving Caribou, wherein Caribou was mistaken for the leader of a local revolutionary movement whose design is an overt reference to one of Fidel Castro's top guys, Che Guevara. What makes this important important is that if Dragon is inspired in part by Castro and the Cuban Revolution, then things come together, because Castro seized power from the prior dictator of Cuba, largely in part due to winning over the public and convincing the defending military to betray and arrest their president. Revolution often takes place from the inside out, as demonstrated here, and if Oda is making these repeated references, then some of Dragon's future plans may also draw from the same influence. If there are turncoats currently working for or within the Marines, conspiring against Akainu and the world nobles, then who is involved and what is their final goal? Sword is clearly working against the upper brass. It involves Kobe, who deeply admires Luffy and was trained and apprenticed by Garp. Kobe directly stood up to Akainu in Marine Ford and almost died for it. Sengoku was involved in a very similar operation in the past with Corazon, and given the relationship Garp and Sengoku have with Aokiji, and considering he's suddenly acting out of character and working with bad guys, his involvement in Sword as a covert operative is also likely. Kobe has been supposedly kidnapped by the Blackbeard pirates, but we have no clue where exactly Kobe is right now, and Kuzan, who's working with Blackbeard, is also mysteriously missing. Are they secretly working out something together while Blackbeard Blackbeard is busy with law? Perhaps. Kuzan being undercover also helps the revolutionaries here, because for whatever reason, the revolutionaries and the Blackbeard pirates have been taking shots at each other. When Burgess discovered Baltigo and the Blackbeard crew came to attack, somehow the revolutionaries made it out with zero fatalities. If Aokiji is feeding Dragon info from the inside, then maybe it explains how. If Saul is the man marked by flame and is working with the revolutionaries, and if Kuzan is the one who saved him, then that's yet another connection. Diaz Drake is another person said to have left the Marines, and yet he is secretly working as a part of S.W.O.R.D. And we know that Sengoku is the one that found him and took him in during the law flashback. Once again, Sengoku has another connection to S.W.O.R.D. So we've established some good rationale behind Garp, Sengoku, Aokiji, Saul, Kobe, Drake, and Dragon as being part of some conspiracy. Could be a stretch, but... One extra detail I noticed is how many of these characters are marked with an X. Boom, boom, boom. This goes for Fujitora, who we're going to talk about later as well. 
and if they aren't marked by an X, they're marked by a burn scar inflicted on them by the world government, a pattern that continues if we also factor in Sabo. But those were the easy ones. What about the ones that aren't so clear just yet? Two that spring to mind are Suru and Smoker. For one thing, Suru, Garp, and Sengoku were a pretty legendary trio of marines who have a long history together, and Suru was also on the receiving end of Rocinante's intel when he was undercover on Minion Island. Then there's Smoker, who has recently also joined the ranks of Vice Admiral and not only questions the orders of his superiors, but has a close relationship with Aokiji. In Punk Hazard, Aokiji had a heart-to-heart -heart with him about leaving the Marines, and Smoker has found himself allied with pirates on more than one occasion. Well, let's say these guys are involved with Dragon and Vegapunk. After all, Garp is Dragon's father. Well, in Logetown, Smoker seemed rather willing to listen to Dragon, who made his manga debut by keeping Smoker at bay. The two even seemed to have some personal familiarity, and when Smoker warned Dragon that the Marines are after his head, he responded, The world is waiting for our answer. Was that our including Smoker? Was this foreshadowing for Smoker's eventual involvement or detachment from the Marines? Maybe it's a stretch, but the possibility is there. If Smoker is close with Aokiji, and Aokiji is close with Garp, and Garp is Kobe's mentor, and Kobe is in Sword, and if Sword is working with Garp's son, Dragon, the father of Luffy, Smoker's pirate ally and rival, it's definitely a long shot, but nonetheless a possibility. Furthermore, if Vegapunk and Dragon are involved in this, then that's not a surprise because our first real explanation on these characters came from Kobe and Garp respectively. Specifically, Vegapunk's involvement also implies that Sword is not the only rogue faction in the government. The SSG are also likely involved because Vegapunk is the head of the science division, which brings a couple other marines onto our radar. First and foremost, Sentomaru. Sentomaru is that weird sumo guy who was introduced to us as Vegapunk's bodyguard and captains a unit of pacifistas. During the time skip, he seemed to have become a full-fledged marine officer despite not having been before, but still works for Vegapunk. Despite acting chummy with Kizaru, Sentomaru also shows a degree of respect for Luffy, so he could go both ways, but I think it would be impossible to work that closely with Vegapunk all this time and somehow not be a part of this thing. The other and last major conspirator I want to talk about today is Admiral Fujitora. Fujitora seems to have a strong distaste for the world government's attitude and moral standards, despite being one of the admirals. He constantly acts in ways unfavorable to the government's agenda, sympathizes with Luffy, and shows genuine care and humility towards the common people. But the most interesting thing about him is his persistence in ending the warlord system, freeing kingdoms like Alabasta and Dressrosa from sanctioned tyranny in the future. And even more interesting is how dead set and confident Fujitora is in their replacement, the SSG. Fujitora, for some reason, pushed this idea harder than anybody else. Not just abolishing the warlord system, but he truly put all his weight behind the instatement of the SSG, claiming it would greatly shift the balance of power. And on the surface, it seems like the balance has shifted in the government's favor, but this entire arm of the military that the Marines are now forced to rely on was created by Dr. Vegapunk, the Seraphim, modeled after the pacifistas, who are modeled after a leading figure in the revolution army were created by a scientist with direct ties to Ohara and Monkey D. Dragon. In simple terms, the world government's shiny new weapons were created by a revolutionary. So what does that say about Fujitora? Is it possible then that Fujitora knew this and pushed for the SSG so that the world government would alienate the warlords, fund its own opposing forces, and back itself into a corner? See, if there's any way I could see the revolutionaries pulling off a successful coup, it would be by turning the government's greatest weapons and resources against them. All the while, the world government doesn't know a damn thing. They're working with Vegapunk, blissfully ignorant that the research on Ohara survived the attack, completely unaware that Vegapunk inherited all their knowledge and research from Saul and figured out who the real villains are. They think his technology is well beyond its time when in fact he's secretly getting his knowledge from the past. So Vegapunk has every reason in the world to utilize their funding to betray them. So what if this army of Seraphim were designed with a code or a special instruction that could be triggered that commands all the Seraphim to change sides, or perhaps commands them to attack celestial dragons instead of government targets? 
One of their prototypes, the original Kuma Pacifista, seems to respond to Dragon as a master. So are Vegapunk's weapons being hard-coded to listen to Dragon's orders? Furthermore, in Chapter 1067, we find out that Vegapunk is essentially trying to recreate the internet, and uh, CP0 is approaching the island with that Kuma Seraphim, talking about how they're gonna kill Bonnie. And all of a sudden, the Kuma Pacifista on Kamabaka Kingdom with the revolutionaries is now getting up and trying to run away somewhere. Punk Records was functional in some way because we know Vegapunk is a perfectionist. It may not be a failure completely. So all of the Seraphim and all of the pacifistas might be connected to Punk Records right now. And that would be how Vegapunk could issue a command to make all of them change their behaviors at once. Maybe this is why Sword and the revolutionaries within the Marines couldn't show themselves up until now because the Seraphim were a crucial part of the plan and didn't exist yet. While I don't personally think this is the best supporting evidence, it might also be worth noting that the Chinese Zodiac is reflected in the Marine's codenames, as the monkey, rooster, and dog next to each other make up the original three admirals. The goat directly next to them can be associated with their boss, the fleet admiral, Sengoku. The tiger and the ox or bull make up the two new admirals on the other end. We have three other vice admirals with color-coded animal names including black horse, brown pig, and pink rabbit. We don't have a rat or a snake yet, but we do have a literal rat person for a marine, and if I had to guess, Smoker is going to be White Snake. Smoker's devil fruit power is white in color, one of his signature moves is literally called White Snake, and he fights people by wrapping them in smoke and constricting them. He even has a sea stone tipped weapon that paralyzes devil fruit users, plus the neighboring marine symbol is Black Horse, so black and white would logically be next to each other. Another alternative for the rat symbolism in the Chinese zodiac would be Monkey D. Garp. The rat is said to be the first symbol in the zodiac, and the story goes that it got to be first by betraying and tricking all the others. If Garp was the first one to start this whole operation and betray the world government from the inside, then it would make sense that Garp is symbolic of the rat. Long story short, there's a pattern emerging here. Most of these slots can be filled by some figure in the Marines. There is, however, no one in the Marines with the title of Dragon or any associations with the animal. If Dragon is secretly leading some insurgency from within the Marines against Akainu, then it's interesting to me how the Dragon sign and the Dog sign are opposite each other in the Zodiac. Maybe Monkey D. Dragon is the missing Dragon in this equation. There are still people we have yet to meet in the Marines who may also be sympathetic to Dragon's cause, and considering the nature of going undercover, pretty much any Marine could have been faking it this entire time and secretly be taking part in a coup. Hanging questions like Akainu's sword tattoo and Bonnie somehow escaping his capture make me wonder how deep this goes, but I can't see him sharing a room with Garp or Kobe or Aokiji, so as far as those mysteries go, consider me stumped. But at the very least, if the Seraphim are designed and intended for more than meets the eye, then all this information might serve to explain what the final plan of the revolutionaries actually is. Ultimately, I believe that there will be a big twist wherein the Seraphim swap sides and make a direct attack on Marijoie. They will return the buster call on them. And in a way, this would be poetic visually, as it would look like the Lunarians taking back their homeland on the Red Line. Imagine Marines then turning their guns against their leaders, and finally Dragon and the Revolutionary Army arriving in a full-scale invasion. The history learned at Laugh Tale will surely bring Luffy and his allies to the battlefield as well, but this is Dragon's fight to begin. Either way, the result will be all three great factions in the One Piece world coming together against a common enemy, each spearheaded by a member of the Monkey family, Luffy and his army of pirates, Dragon and his army of revolutionaries, and Garp and his army of marines. These three men, who all declared their own war against the powers that be, will come together to change the course of history. The burning of Ohara did not erase the will of its people, but instead was the fire that sparked the greatest revolution in the One Piece world. That's going to be all for today, guys. I have some more I'd like to add to this theory, but I don't want to add anything else until some more supporting details come in. What do you guys think? Is there a secret conspiracy unfolding within the Marines as we speak? Who else do you think is involved? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe to keep the music alive. Thanks again for stopping by the Hidden Island. As always, I hope you've enjoyed the show today because I sure enjoyed putting it on. Until next time, have a pleasant day, a good night, and a wonderful romance dawn. Thank you.